All right. Cool. Um, what did you have for lunch anyway? <laughs> um, We're going to talk about other things, but. Uh, I mean, for lunch, I had, I had tortilla chips and black coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had both those things today. <laughs> I mean, I drink a lot of coffee. I'm a big coffee enthusiast. Like, I would be nothing if it weren't for coffee. So, I, I have everything to it. Nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, I want, first thing I wanted to talk about was your use of humor, which I'm enjoying the hell out of. Um, so, your memoir, Mean, it's... Uh, it's really funny, and it also touches on really serious topics, rape, murder, and racism. Um, <laughs> Those are serious. <laughs> put it lightly. Um, well, tell me about using humor to convey trauma. Um, so, the, one of the, re like, the, the use of humor in Mean um, was intentional. Um, and the use of humor was a response to what I found to be sort of these storytelling habits that were developing. Um, when uh, it came to uh, narrating um, sexual trauma in the mm -hmm. United States. So um, when I first began writing uh, a few of the fragments that came to be included in Mean, I approached those fragments as experiments. They were narrative experiments, and they specifically were experiments in presenting sexual trauma and writing about sexual trauma and writing through sexual trauma in a way that uh, invited me to be much more spontaneous and also in a way that invited playfulness, right? You need spontaneity in order to be able to play. And I think that um, uh, a person's ability to engage in that sort of spontaneity and a person's uh, ability to engage and play indicates that they are healing from trauma. Mm -hmm. So if you encounter a narrative that is lacking in those properties or is lacking in those elements, that narration... Um, feels kind of stunted, it feels ossified, and there's a sense of sort of social death to narratives that are written in that style. Uh -huh. And that, uh, to me, seemed to be sort of the prevailing style uh, that was emerging about sort of 10 or so years ago. And as an example, I'll give the work of Alice Siebold, so I had, I had encountered her work, I had encountered her memoir, Lucky, and her novel, The Lovely Bones. Um, and I wanted to write about my experience of sexual assault very differently. And um, uh, I have, um, I've had like a, I come from a funny family, you know what I mean? I think a lot of funny people uh, come from funny parents, right? They mm -hmm. sort of shape us. My mom is funny, my dad is funny, and um, I think that both of them have developed um, their senses of humor largely in response to trauma and largely in response to tragedy, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's a way, I, I, um, humor becomes a way to weather a storm yeah and for victims of sexual assault comedy and humor can be ways to again weather that storm and i also think they become a way to sort of recuperate parts of yourself that have been fucked with um the other thing that i think is really valuable about humor and that's valuable about uh comedy is um the perspective that it gives a survivor so when you laugh with somebody, you're laughing with a peer, right? You're seeing eye to eye. When you laugh at, you position yourself above. So you're taking the higher ground and you're claiming authority and you're claiming superiority. And uh, I position myself that way as a narrator and mean where uh, I'm laughing at largely. 
Um, and so for me, that's, that's healing to be able to laugh at somebody who harmed me because mm -hmm. that positions me here. Right. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to sort of offer to other survivors a way of pivoting and repositioning themselves, not just in relationship to the event, but in relationship to perpetrators as well. Mm -hmm. That we can position ourselves above them. And humor is a way to achieve that. Yes, that's cool. You're like <laughs> punching down at the patriarchy, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Huh. How do how do people react? Um the reactions have been varied. Um, a lot of people have commented to me, a lot of readers, especially survivors, have commented to me that it either had not occurred to them that they could articulate and narrate um, a chronicle of their trauma in this way. Um, some people have um take an issue with the introduction of comedy or humor into a story like mine because again they they uh suggest that um that humor doesn't have a place in a story that involves um sexual violence right. But to me, that seems stifling. And to me, to dictate to a survivor that she can't access that is another way of delegitimizing the survivor's experience. Um, and, and again, the storytelling habits that I saw forming were troublesome because it seemed that, um, that uh, survivors were required to tell their story with almost like a, a religious quality and like this tone of reverence. And it's like reverence for what? Why should I revere one of the worst moments of my life when I was degraded? I'm not gonna approach that with reverence. It was fucking sick, <laughs> you know what I mean? So why should I take a religious approach to it? I should be able to mock the person that did this to me because ultimately what they were doing was mocking my ability to exist. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I have had some folks, um, I have been critiqued for having done that, but I understood that that was going to provoke that critique. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm a big fan of laughing to keep from crying. Like <laughs> right? <laughs> Man, yeah. How does this humor tie into your, your theory of meanness, the meanness that you discuss in, in me? Um, okay, so... Um, I, I enjoy challenging humor, right? Like there are so many different types of humor. I enjoy humor that pushes right up against that boundary. And sometimes it transgresses. Sometimes it's a little too painful. Sometimes it becomes too violent. Sometimes I punch inappropriately. Um, but I like to give myself the ability to to experiment and to make those mistakes. Um, and and I, I do issue apologies um, when when I transgress and and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and and I go too far. But um, in terms of meanness, um, one of the one of the sort of projects, uh, or one of the elements of um, mean as a project was uh, to present myself as sort of a character, to present myself as a narrator who wasn't necessarily like the most sympathetic narrator, right? So uh, I, I narrate myself into existence and I, and I discuss um, who I am and I, I'm sort of no holds barred about my personality and how biting it can be and uh, how cruel my humor can be. But at the same time, I'm inviting readers to continue to experience empathy for me in spite of my not being uh, what they might consider to be the most uh, the easiest person to empathize with. Sure. That's part of the project of the book. Like I shouldn't have to be perfect and I shouldn't have to be humble and I shouldn't have to grovel for you to feel something for me if I'm assaulted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
contingent. Like your allyship, your empathy shouldn't be contingent on me being a, a good girl or a good woman, <laughs> a good woman. And, um, and uh, some, you know, some readers walk right into the trap and, and they have said, I can't, I had to put the book down because I didn't like her. And, wow. and that's, and, and that was sort of the point. Can you dislike me and still feel, and still feel compassion for me? And yeah. some people yoke those two things together. You have to be likable for me to give you compassion. And to me, that's not real compassion. That's <laughs> transactional, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. That's that's a great space to be working in. I love what you do. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, on to another light topic. I, w I wanted to talk about American Dirt. <laughs> uh, so I, I haven't read it. I don't see any reason I should, but it's from, by most accounts that I trust, it's an ill-conceived and offensive book. Um, and it's one that people in the publishing industry decided was going to be a hit. Um, and it was. And it's, yeah. it's dispiriting, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, how do you continue making art knowing that oftentimes a project's success is kind of preordained like that? Um, so I often approach art in this way. I tell myself I would like for there to be an audience. I would like for an audience to exist for whatever it is I happen to be creating in this moment. Yeah. But an audience might never come to this work and that's okay. So that's, that's the mindset with which I create. And then there's a second component to that too. The other thing that I will often tell myself when, when I embark on a project is nobody might like this. <laughs> Everybody mm -hmm. might hate this and I have to be okay with that because mm -hmm. I'm making this for the sake of of um of of it being liked i'm making it because of a compulsion right because i think that artists are compulsive people i think that um we do what we do because we feel that we have to and if we don't i uh, there's a, a sense of discomfort that we carry and 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 our way of sort of working through uh, our existence is, is is to make sense of it through art. We think through existence and we think through uh, life's problems as they present themselves through whatever genre or medium we work in. And so in a sense, I think that for artists, art is our math, right? So we're constantly working through these equations using a very different set of tools. So uh, whether or not the art is consumed by any sort of market, is not of consequence, even though that's what I aspire to. So that kind of insulates me. And then the fact that like, I exist at like these intersecting uh, 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 marginalizations, right? I'm a queer person, I'm femme, uh, I'm Chicana means that in all likelihood my audience is going to be a lot smaller and I know that and so I'm not positioned like uh, Janine Cummins, right? I'm not positioned for that kind of success. I don't have those doors automatically open to me and and I've always understood that. Yeah. I'm at peace with that, you know? Sure, sure. Yeah, sometimes I comfort myself like if I'm feeling kind of stressed about writing or I'm just like look out the window at all the cars at the stoplight and I'm like, these people don't read books. It doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And then the other thing that comforts me is death. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm just like, well, I'm going to fucking die too. So <laughs> it's all going to come to an end. And then all those people out there driving those cars, they're going to fucking die too. And it's, <laughs> and it's really soothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're in the void. We might as well do whatever. Do what exactly. We want. Like, I mean, I don't particularly care for Heidegger, the philosopher, right? I mean, he was Hitler's right hand dude when it came to like uh, 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 the philosophy of the Reich. But one thing that I do appreciate very much about Heidegger is that he was once asked during a lecture, um, how is it that, that, I mean, and I'm paraphrasing, how is it that people can really come into uh, embracing life and, 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 and understanding sort of uh, life in its most authentic form 
And he was silent for a couple moments. And then he advised the person asking the question to spend more time in graveyards. <laughs> and that's sort of what I carry with me. You know, I carry this image of a graveyard in my head and that sort of keeps me going because I'm going to wind up there too. And so are you, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> students of it constantly i remind my students of that constantly like let's keep in mind that we're gonna die and then <laughs> this is really limited so what are we gonna do with this little gift that we've been given because it's a pretty small gift you know yeah <laughs> well with that in mind what are you working on now so right now i'm working on a couple of different um projects so i have been I'm writing and publishing uh, articles um, and essays, and then I'm also working on a sequel to Mean. Uh -huh. um, and so, so that's been really challenging. That's probably the most emotionally challenging thing that I have um, taken on as of late. And then I'm also working with a classical composer um, to develop lyrics for a choral performance. Wow. So, never worked with a musician before, let alone somebody who composes classically. So that's kind of exciting. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Do you listen to music when you write? Um, I seldom can, although um, I have been experimenting a bit more with listening to music when I write. If I do listen to music when I write, it can't have lyrics. It mm. absolutely cannot have lyrics because um, for me, part of uh writing is approaching uh the rhythm of language and if i am writing and listening to words i start trying to harmonize what i'm writing with what i'm listening to and i can't fucking do that <laughs> you know what i mean i have to sort of develop this melody as i'm as, I, as i'm working so i pay a lot of attention to like to the way that words sound uh internally yeah, cool. And music can disrupt that. I, I, I agree. You um, you I know you did Sister Spit a few years ago. Do do you write kind of with reading out loud in mind? I got that sense from from reading. Yeah, I, I I did. I have gone on the Sister Spit tour several times, and that uh, experience has shaped uh, my writing ear. Right. So mm -hmm. I write with my eye, but I also write with my ear. And I always consider like um, how a work might be performed. And I often write work um, with that sort of end game in mind. So if I were to be on a stage, how would I be delivering this? What would it sound like? And one of the things that I'm really invested in is silence. So where are the silences going to be? Because for me, a lot of the drama in a work is exists in the pause, like the various pauses. That's where the drama is. And that's also where a lot of the humor is, is in the silence. You know what I mean? Especially silences that aren't supposed to be there or a silence that you drag somebody into because silence is uncomfortable, right? Even silence on the page is uncomfortable and it tends to elicit a giggle. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. So Sister Spit did a lot to influence uh, my writing ear. Cool. Well, uh, did I miss anything or is there anything you'd like to add? I think I'm good. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm going to stop recording and we can, uh, we can say goodbye. And thank you, of course. Yeah, my pleasure. <laughs>